We lack the words to describe the sheer level of suffering that ordinary Israelis and Palestinians have endured over the past two weeks. For Israelis, the Hamas attack on October the 7th constituted the single worst event in their country's history. Children and the elderly among the dead, in fact, the most Jewish people killed in one day since the Holocaust. A grief compounded by the taking of hostages in that brutal Hamas raid, which killed more than a thousand people inside of Israel. For Palestinians, as the UN's top humanitarian official Martin Griffiths puts it, the specter of death is hanging over Gaza. Thousands of Palestinians, including hundreds of children, killed. Water, food, fuel, medicines in shockingly short supply as residents try to avoid constant Israeli airstrikes. Not to mention the Israeli military telling 1.1 million Gazans to evacuate the north ahead of an expected ground invasion. An order that the UN's Griffiths says defies the rules of war and basic humanity. So today, where does it end? How does it end? Does it ever end? As President Biden visits Israel and as we await a ground invasion of Gaza, how many more innocent people are going to die and what will be achieved? For Israel, it's very clear as to what this war is all about and why it has to happen because of those Hamas acts of terror on the Jewish holiday of Simcha Torah less than two weeks ago. Somehow, under cover of rocket fire, over a thousand armed Hamas militants streamed from Gaza into southern Israel, taking not just military bases and Israeli soldiers by surprise, almost 50 years to the day after the Yom Kippur war was launched, but then raiding towns and villages, going house to house, indiscriminately killing Israeli civilians. Some victims found burned in their own homes, even in safe rooms built for emergencies, but unable to prevent a nightmare. Israel also revealing to the world that terrorists murdered children, including babies, in brutal fashion. Now, for the past week, I have to point out here, there's been misinformation that's affected both sides. We have had some supporters of Israel suggesting 40 babies were not just killed, but beheaded, which has never been verified even by the Israeli government. And we've had some opponents of Israel suggesting that the images of dead babies that were officially released by Israel were fake, were AI generated, even though that's been debunked. What we do know, and what's outrageous enough, is that kids were killed. And kids were also taken hostage by Hamas as part of the nearly 200 people from Israel who were being held inside of Gaza, according to the IDF. NBC News has confirmed that this video is of a 12-year-old boy taken into Gaza from his home in Israel. His mother telling NBC News how she listened over the phone as her sons aged 16 and 12 were abducted from a safe room in their home. I could hear people speaking in Arabic outside their door. And they broke in, and the last thing I heard was the youngest, who's 12, saying to them, I'm too young, don't take me. And that was it. That was the last time I heard from them. It's heartbreaking. Whatever your feelings on the generations-long struggle between Palestinians and Israelis, or the decades-long occupation of the West Bank and Gaza, the past violence and violations of the law, and I have strong opinions on all of that, as you know, to attack civilians especially children in this way, was undeniably a vicious act of terror. The question is, what do you do about it? For the Israeli government, the main response has been to bomb and besiege Gaza, because this, they say, is their 9-11. This is Israel's 9-11. This is Israel's 9-11. And Israel will do everything to bring our sons and daughters back home. This is, uh, as someone said, our 9-11. In a way, this is our 9-11. This is our 9-11. Look, I get it. I get the comparison between 3,000 dead in America on September the 11th, 2001, and 1,400 dead in Israel on October the 7th, 2023. In fact, for Israelis, it's even worse as a proportion of their much smaller population. And there are a lot of similarities between the two attacks. Then, as now, there were questions about how this could have happened, about security and intelligence failures, about missed warnings by the government. Then, as now, there was an instant rush to assign state sponsorship to the attack without the necessary evidence. 
Then as now, a war was launched to defeat terrorism, to destroy terrorist groups, and even to eradicate evil. My administration has a job to do, and we're going to do it. We will rid the world of the evildoers. George W. Bush also spoke back then of an axis of evil and of light overcoming darkness in his so-called war against terror. Today, Benjamin Netanyahu speaks of ridding Gaza of evildoers, of a new axis of evil, and even says this is a struggle between the children of light and the children of darkness. To be clear, Bush didn't rid the world of evildoers. The axis of evil as a concept was nonsense, and our response to 9-11 involved killing, yes, a lot of terrorists, but also a lot of innocent people around the world. Brown University's Cost of War project estimates nearly a million people were killed as a direct result of the war on terror. Terrorist attacks after 9-11 went up, not down. Our invasion of Iraq helped birth ISIS. And as for our 20-year-long occupation of Afghanistan, well, the Taliban are currently back in charge over there. So why would Israel want to emulate our failed and disastrous response to 9-11? We did war, occupation, torture, rendition, surveillance. And in the years that followed, did any of that make us safer? In fact, as even hawkish Bush Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld, as even he wrote in a memo back in 2003, quote, we lack metrics to know if we are winning or losing the global war on terror. Are we capturing, killing, or deterring and dissuading more terrorists every day than the madresas and the radical clerics are recruiting, training, and deploying against us? Well, 20 years later, Take a look at Gaza. Does anyone think those images, that destruction, which the Israeli military is almost bragging about in this tweet, make Palestinians more or less likely to hate Israel, more or less likely to be recruited by Hamas, more or less likely to participate in an end to this gruesome and decades-long conflict? Think about everything Israel has said and done since October the 7th, everything it's unleashed on the two million-plus Palestinian inhabitants of the occupied and blockaded Gaza Strip. Put aside, even for a moment, international law and basic morality, just from an Israeli security perspective, from a Donald Rumsfeld metrics perspective. Does the Israeli defense minister ordering a complete siege of Gaza with no electricity, no food, no fuel, help defeat Hamas and end the threat of terrorism to Israelis? Does creating an even more severe water shortage in Gaza, where 97% of fresh water was already undrinkable, and where a group of Palestinians even told the Associated Press they are now so dehydrated they urinate once a day or even every other day, does that help defeat Hamas and end the threat of terrorism to Israelis? Does a prominent retired Israeli general saying his country has no choice but to turn Gaza into a place that is, quote, temporarily or permanently impossible to live in? Or an Israeli parliamentary from parliamentarian from Netanyahu's party calling for a second Nakba, a second expulsion of the Palestinians. Does that help defeat Hamas and end the threat of terrorism to Israelis? Does ordering the evacuation of 22 hospitals in northern Gaza, an order that the normally sober World Health Organization called a death sentence for the sick and injured, does that help defeat Hamas and end the threat of terrorism to Israelis? Does killing thousands of innocent Palestinians in Gaza and not just members of Hamas, killing a Palestinian child every 15 minutes since October the 7th, according to the NGO Defense of Children International, does that help defeat Hamas and end the threat of terrorism to Israelis? Does it bring back any of the innocent Israelis killed on October the 7th? Those are the questions that have to be answered, that can't be ignored. And just on those casualty figures, I accept that they're from Gaza's health ministry, and Gaza is under Hamas rule, so critics do understandably question some of those figures. Just as this week, they questioned the health ministry's account of a horrible attack on a Gaza hospital that they, the health ministry, initially said was an Israeli airstrike that killed more than 500 people. Israeli and U.S. officials now say it was an errant rocket misfired by Palestinian Islamic Jihad from inside of Gaza. According to NBC News, the facts have yet to be fully established. But what's clear is Hamas should not be fully trusted, but nor should Israel. Human rights groups point out that Israeli airstrikes on Hamas in the past have also hit hospitals, medical facilities, civilians. And remember, Israel repeatedly denied its soldiers had killed Palestinian-American journalist Shireen Abu Akleh last year, initially claiming she was killed by Palestinian gunmen until the evidence against them became incontrovertible. But I have to say here, 
anyone who is seriously claiming that innocent Palestinians in Gaza, including children, aren't being killed, aren't being displaced, aren't suffering right now, are being just as deluded or disingenuous as those who, as I mentioned earlier, deny what happened to Israeli kids on October the 7th. I mean, how many more deaths, how many more funerals, how many more bodies have to be buried for people to realize just how real this trauma is for Gaza? This week, the president of the United States went to Israel and actually addressed the 9-11 analogy and was also pretty open about the dangers of Israel responding to October the 7th the way we responded to September the 11th. After 9-11, we were enraged in the United States. While we sought justice and got justice, we also made mistakes. And yet Biden, despite saying that, also said this. As long as the United States stands and we will stand forever, we'll not let you ever be alone. The world will know that Israel is, str Israel is stronger than ever. You can't say in one breath, hey, Israel, don't make the mistakes we did after 9-11, and then in the next breath, publicly offer Israel, in effect, a blank check for war. Remember, the Bush administration went into Afghanistan and then Iraq with no plan for the day after, and it was a disaster. And yet, Israel's ambassador to the UN told CNN on Sunday, we're not thinking now what will happen the day after the war. We need to win this war. And that's the only thing that we're focused on. Or as one top Israeli defense expert told The Economist, I don't care what happens next. Whatever it is, it starts with destroying Hamas. Bomb first, plan later. That was a Bush script after 9-11. The thing is, you don't even have to look to the U.S. war on terror to see evidence of catastrophic failure. The Israelis have already bombed Gaza before in 2006, 2007, 2008, 2012, 2014, 2019, 2021, and 2022. They've assassinated top Hamas officials, operatives, bomb makers again and again with bullets, missiles, and car bombs. They've invaded. They've occupied. They've tightened a blockade around Gaza for 16 long years. And yet, despite all of that, the October 7th attack still happened. Some retired Israeli generals even draw a straight line between the two things. Quote, it is absurd to hope that Israel can indefinitely contain, with its military might and security services, millions of Palestinians who claim the right to self-determination and a free, normal life, Shlomo Brom, who led strategic planning for the Israeli military, told The Economist last week. He added, quote, eventually the oppressed will rise against their oppressor. And with horrific consequences, I should add. Listen also to Ami Ayalon, a retired admiral and ex-commander who led Shin Bet, Israel's internal security service. Here's what he said in an interview with the French newspaper Le Figaro last week. Quote, yes, we have no choice as to destroy the Hamas militant brigades, but we should completely change our policy in order to create a Palestinian partner. We must say from the start that our war is not against the Palestinian people. Our war is against the military wing of Hamas. Before we even attack, we should say that we want to create a reality in which we will talk with the Palestinians who accept the peace initiatives and who want to discuss with us the reality of two states. But I believe that no Israeli government will agree to do this today. Yet if we do not do so, we will see an increase in violence. Economic development will not be enough for them. They want freedom. They want to see an end to the occupation. Palestinian freedom and an end to the Israeli occupation of the West Bank and, yes, Gaza. That is how you end the violence in the long run. It shouldn't take a retired Israeli security chief to point that out. It's common sense. But you know what? Too often, too often, Expressing our very human and understandable support for the very human and innocent victims of terror attacks morphs almost unthinkingly into unconditional support for unconditional violence. For a long time now, and for many countries, not just Israel, dropping bombs has quite frankly become easier than offering hope. And so, of course, Israel, like any country would after a massacre of its citizens, of course Israel wants to go after Hamas. In fact, Israeli officials say they plan to wipe Hamas off the face of the earth and eradicate tens of thousands of Hamas fighters and members with a bombing campaign and maybe a ground invasion of Gaza, too. But if you kill tens of thousands of innocent Palestinians in the process, if you starve and brutalize an entire population of millions, if you leave the Gaza Strip a wreck again, all that will happen is that another militant group will emerge in its place. We know this. We've seen this movie before. 
not just with America in Afghanistan, but with Israel in Gaza. If the Israeli military going out and bombing or invading Gaza was the solution, then why hasn't it worked the last half a dozen or so times the Israelis have tried it? Surely, at some point, we have to remember that one definition of insanity is doing the same thing again and again and expecting different results.